Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, Quesgrin Lunch and Learn. Uh, I'm Anna Hunt from Quesgrin and I'll be providing tech support today. Um, I will give details just now about how to participate in the Lunch and Learn before passing you all to our moderator and our speaker for today. Um, firstly, while we meet today on a virtual platform, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous land. Uh, the Ganyankehage uh, nation is recognized as the custodians of these lands and waters on which we gather today. Jodjage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today it is the home, um, it is home, sorry, to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. Uh, we respect the continued connection with the past, present and future uh, in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. I will now leave you uh, with the, my moderator, uh, our moderator, Lorraine O'Donnell. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. I'm Lorraine O'Donnell, as Anna mentioned. Thanks, Anna. Uh, I'm Research Associate at Questgrin, the Quebec English Speaking Communities Research Network. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Dorothy Williams. Dorothy is a historian, author, educator, researcher, content developer, and media consultant. Dorothy has authored three books and contributed to other scholarly and academic publications. Blacks in Montreal, 1628 to 1986, was written in 1989. In 1997, The Road to Now, A History of Blacks in Montreal was released, and it remains the only chronological study of Montreal's Black people. In 1998, Les Noirs à Montréal, Essai de démographie urbaine, was released. With a strong Afrocentric perspective, Dorothy, Dr. Williams, has conducted teacher training, professional and public presentations, and created pedagogical resources with the objective of making Black history accessible. Today, Dorothy will present research she carried out for a Questgren working paper, and its full title is A Posthumous Honor for a Conspicuous Life, Dr. Gaspard in Quebec. Before turning the floor over to Dorothy, I would like to thank our sponsors. Questgrant gratefully uh, acknowledges support from Canadian Heritage, which funds this Lunch and Learn series, and the Secretariat aux Relations avec les Québécois d'Expression Anglaise, which funded Dorothy Williams's working paper on which this presentation is based. So the schedule for today is that Dorothy will make a 20 minute presentation and then we will have another, actually I can see we're good on time, so another 25 minutes or so for questions and answers. And I really encourage people to engage with Dr. Williams who's very forthcoming and friendly and great about sharing her knowledge. So with that said, I will now give the floor to Dr. Dorothy Williams. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I love history. I'm very passionate about history. Uh, I have been teaching and sharing my knowledge with the general population for a good 30 plus years. Um, but I have to say, I'm really excited about this research that I'm involved in. Um, this has been a really, really interesting discovery for me, a really wonderful journey that has opened up my eyes to many aspects of being Black in Montreal um, before the Second World War. Um, I must say, had I known about what I'm going to share with you this afternoon in the writings that I've done in terms of articles in my books, I would have a very different nuanced, perhaps, analysis of uh, the Black experience in Montreal and certainly would ask more questions. Um, and I think that would help to broaden our understanding of um, les autres. English speaking people within Quebec and how being black in a quote a marginalized community was so different, so unique and so rich. So let me just um, share with you a quick uh, 
summary uh, of, of Dr. Gaspar's life. And then I really want to talk to you about the research experience that I had while I was doing this for um, thanks to the, the funding and support of, of QScreen. Dr. Gaspar um, was born in New Orleans in the United States uh, to a Catholic family, grew up in the parish of what we today would call St. Catharines, um, and wound up coming to Quebec. My understanding is he went directly to Seminaire St. Hyacinth, I'm pronouncing that really badly, but um, there is a seminary there, uh, apparently a very famous one. It's been around for over 100 years, 150 years. And um, he was a student there for six years. And the next phase of his life after that, I'm going to get into some details as I, as I continue to explore a little bit more about what I've learned in those periods. He then uh, went into medical studies at University of Laval, eventually to become University of Montreal. And um, then joined up when the First World War started. He was recruited to join um, the medical services that went to France and became distinguished there. He was awarded by the um, Minister of War in France and came back to Canada decorated and did not go back to St. Hyacinth to live, but rather joined the Montreal Black community of which I wrote about. At that point, he enters into my narrative that I, I shared with people um, about the Black community. And apparently, unbeknownst to me, um, was one of the pioneers, one of the builders in the community at the time. Um, so it would be up until about mid 19. 40s, 1930s, sorry, and um, played a significant role in the development of or the establishment of Black community life in Montreal. Um, he, his story really came to me um, almost by accident uh, last fall. Um, I was teaching a course here at uh, Concordia University. Um, called Black Montreal. And uh, I have this wealth of archives that I was pulling, putting together this course and happened to get to a period of time um, post First World War and where people were talking about in my interviews and my research about the Dr. Gaspar Legion Hall. And this was apparently one of the non-segregated areas or, or establishments that Blacks could participate in. And in fact, they did. So I was quite interested in figuring out why this Black Legion in Little Burgundy was actually named Dr. Gaspar. I had no clue who he was. And I wanted to make sure at the time I didn't get caught with one of the students putting their hands up and saying, who was Dr. Gaspar? Okay, so <laughs> I started to do a little bit of, of research and I checked my books. Um, in fact, yes, I do mention him. And there was an interview that was done with Mr. Gale, Tamus Gale, who um, is a was a local historian, he's dead now, and his area of expertise or interest was tracing the lives of black veterans. So he was the perfect person to ask, and, and I'm quoting from my book, because um, I asked him about the Dr. Gaspar branch of the Colored Veterans, the Legion, and he said, the Dr. Gaspar branch of the Colored War veterans suffered terribly when many of its members moved to the suburbs and other parts of the city where they joined integrated legion branches closer to where they live and the loss of members forced the branch to close and that was it at the time when i did the interview with dr gale i didn't ask who dr gaspar was so i didn't understand in 2019 um, really his significance to these black men um, and so 2019 is not 1997. So with Google, I started searching, who is Dr. Gaspar? I was hard pressed to explain really, obviously his name being Gaspar, I realized he was French. I'm not sure if I made the assumption that he was just some general somewhere that had been accorded this honor at this, uh, this black branch. So um, it piqued my interest 
And within a month of doing some serious research, I found out that there was actually a person, a black man called Dominic Gaspar. Wow. Okay. A little bits and of information every now and then he would somebody would mention Dr. Gaspar and I realized that this was a person whose lineage and impact in the community I wasn't aware of. Um, I wasn't aware of the impact other than the name of the Legion Hall. So what I really wanted to look at was did his life in Montreal really help us to understand a little bit more about the diversity of blackness within Montreal at that time. Most of my studies, I confess, um, have been about the black Protestant experience. Here was a Catholic. And it was at that point that I started to go into studies of, well, what was going on with black Catholics and why would they come to Montreal? If he was from New Orleans, what was he doing in St. Hyacinth? And when he was in St. Hyacinth at the seminary, how did he wind up in Montreal? So I wanted to try to understand that because one of the other features that I found out through uh, Tamis Gale and others is that the branch was actually named in 1953. So you can take that in for a second. Dr. Gaspar died in 1938. Why would they have named this, this legion, their legion, after Dr. Gaspar, 15 years after he had died? So I wanted to know who he was. How did they feel about him? Are there any records that tell us who he was and what he, um, what he meant to them? So if we're looking at it from the perspective of why is this important, well, obviously from a policy perspective, black history isn't taught in school. We have very few role models that children are taught, just in general, uh, taught about. And um, I had an inkling as I was studying this that in fact, Dr. Gaspar was somebody that we should know about. His life should be revealed to us in Montreal because even though, um, you know, started out in, in New Orleans, he stayed here and he died in Montreal. Okay, so I wanted to move beyond another, I think another reason that sort of propelled me to continue to study this was I wanted to move beyond the focus of, you know, we often talk about porters and jazz and music and entertainment, but there are other stories, there are other nuggets of information that can really help us understand a lot more about what was going on in the black community and the larger uh, English speaking community. Uh, so his life to me would be an example of that. It would certainly um, give us a little bit more uh, detail, if you will. Um, and also his story in Montreal is unique, at least at this point. It's unique because it, I think it's the only story that we have where we, we have a trace of off-island Black experience and it transfers to Montreal. Why do I say that? Because, well, first of all, this is rarely covered in Black literature within Quebec, except of course, for those of you that are aware of Nigger Rock um, and the research that has gone on in, in St. Armand and uh, the Eastern Townships. Um, but closer to Montreal, very, very little. Um, and in doing so, I was very excited to find out, or sort of shocked to find out, that he was not the only one. In fact, the seminary the, at St. Hyacinth had educated Blacks since 1840s. African Americans had come into Quebec to get their education, their Catholic education at this seminary. And I was like, who the hell knows that? Where did that come from? Um, so you have a bilingual African American who undertook his studies in the French sector at Seminar St. Hyacinth before the First World War. And then finding out that there's at least a dozen other black men um, whose records are in the archives at this seminary that, again, we didn't know anything about. And it's truly an amazing 
aspect of the story of, of Blacks within Quebec that still needs to be told. Um, his life in uh, the United States is told through the stories of the Josephites, which was a Black lay order of the Catholic Church specifically mandated to teach and to, to educate and support Black Catholics in the United States. They were the ones sending African Americans to this seminary in St. Hyacinth. Now, my research never under, I never covered, uh, figured out why or how or who were involved in this um, that had gone on for several decades, that there was a connection between these two uh, institutions, Catholic institutions. So this is really a transnational, continental story that is yet to be explored. Um, I don't know of any research that even touches on this. It's a really fascinating aspect and, and one I had to learn because I know nothing about Catholicism. Um, the stories about uh, the Black community and its development have all revolved around the Protestants, uh, the Union United Church, the Methodists, the um, AME, the African Methodist Episcopals, the British Methodist Episcopals, etc. cetera. Um, it's not ever really touched the Black Catholic, French or English communities, and do they exist in Montreal? So these were the kinds of things that I kind of put in the back of my head as I continue to, to do a little bit more research about who he was and the influences that he brought into the community. Um, as I said before, he was a military hero. And at the time, uh, I remember, remember saying to Lorraine, isn't it interesting? He, um, he was awarded the Medaille des Epidemies. <laughs> and I'm like, we're in the middle of an epidemic. And he was awarded the medal for epidemie, which um, I understood was uh, the highest honor given during the war for people's, uh, for, for those in the military um, that had the responsibility for sanitation and cleanliness and uh, the, the physical health of, uh, of the men in the army, the men and the women in the army. So at the hospital that he was stationed at, which was um, in the suburbs of Paris called St. Cloud, that was the, uh, the borough, or I think it's the suburb it's called, in Paris. Um, there was a hospital unit set up there and uh, he won this award before he came back. So he wound up coming um, home before the end of the war, specifically to finish his medical training. And he was supposed to get his degree and then go back, but the war ended before that. So um, he remained in the city. Uh, he could have, with his education, his medical degree, his uh, bilingualism uh, and his, I am assuming dual citizenship, he could have gone anywhere, including back home to New Orleans. He chose to stay here. And as a result, he became a community builder. Um, at that time, one of, I won't say elite, but certainly um, one of the men outside of the Porter class that had, um, I'd say, uh, that involved the majority of the men in Montreal, he served them. And so he's one of the first members of, we have, for those of you who aren't aware, we have um, community centers at that time. We have two major ones and we have two other institutions. So there are four institutions. There was the church, there was the Colored Women's Club, there was the UNIA, which is the Universal Negro Improvement Association, and there was also the Negro Community Center. So when you talk about community building within the Black community even today, they all come from these four any one of these four. They're emblematic, a representative of these four. Um, and so we find out, I found out, he had roots in three of these four institutions. Um, he was married to, uh, he wound up marrying a Protestant woman, uh, the Catholic at that time. And I saw that that distinction in my research because he was married, they wound up when they died being buried in two separate graves. Emma Mount Royal and her in Cote d'Anage, 
um, because of their religion here in the province. They wouldn't uh, serve, they wouldn't allow them to rest together. Um, this incredible uh, education that he had at St. Hyacinth, this education, this Catholic education that he had at St. Hyacinth, and he marries this Protestant woman. They had no children, and he became involved in her community here in Montreal. She was a um, daughter of a very uh, prominent black man who was active. And um, Dr. Gaspar went from what one would assume a very conservative perspective or uh, perspective on life. He becomes a Garveyite and is one of the initial uh, supporters and members of the UNIA which was a uh, Garveyite institution in Montreal. Haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, not sure how to reconcile that. Uh, it, seemed, it seemed almost contradictory to me, uh, but I think a little bit more research will help us to understand how he could straddle both worlds. Um, just absolutely fascinating. He was also, from what I understand, a founding member of the Negro Community Center. I have studied the Negro Community Center for decades. I grew up in the Negro Community Center. I never heard of the name Dr. Gaspar associated with the Negro Community Center. I've heard of Dr. Bourne, heard of Dr. Melville, I've heard of others, but never Dr. Gaspar. So again, it was a real surprise to me. Um, another area where I found his life was quite unique. Uh, really interesting is because he was bilingual he actually served in the community so we know at some point he had an office in Virginia, he had an office in little burgundy had an office in old montreal and he served both white and blacks at the time that was what i found to be quite unique as well because we know at the same time that the um, mcgill uh, and um, the hospitals were refusing black doctors and black nurses. In fact, they were um, negotiating with Howard University in the States to send um, black students from Quebec to the United States. And why was that? Because whites here didn't want them touching them. They didn't want black touching them. So um, yet you had this doctor with a successful cabinet, cabinet uh, or office, if you will, um, to serve apparently, and he served well, both, uh, Bilingual, because he was bilingual, he served the French and the English in the community. Um, I wanted to know a little bit about the, the Legion Hall named after him. So I contacted Ottawa to find out what information they had about this Dr. Gaspar branch and was blown away. I had what I call a uh, oh wow moment on the phone with the archivist because she she told me this, do you know this is the only black le this is the only legion in canada that was specifically open for black people i said are you kidding me she said no she said we know have no other records of that happening and that's again something i didn't realize uh, even when i was writing about the legion in little burgundy um so the fact that it was named after him just like okay I said, here's something else for me to kind of continue to wrap my head around this story because it's so rich and it needs so much more study. Um, okay, so I think what is so significant about the Dr. Gaspar, I mean, I could go on. I mean, there are obviously other milestones, other oh wow moments, oh my God moments. Um, and this article that I wrote is just sort of like a small capsule of that. Um, but it opens up so many other questions and avenues of study, um, which unfortunately we just don't have that, those kind of researchers in, in, uh, in Montreal. But um, hopefully over time, we're going to find out a lot more about this transnational relationship between Quebec uh, and, and uh, 
Baltimore, where the, the Josephites had their headquarters. I don't know if, in fact, he came through Baltimore or if it was directly through the St. Catherine's Parish he grew up with. He grew up in uh, New Orleans, but that in itself would be very interesting to find out. Um, and I believe we can also understand a little bit more through the Dr. Gaspar story about how citizenship played into language, race, and racialization in the first half of the 20th century. And I'll give you a little what I mean by that. Um, Dr. Gaspar, as I mentioned, stayed at the seminary for six years. The story of those other black men, none of them stayed at the seminary longer than four years. But at, when he finished at the seminary, he wanted to become a Dominican. according to their own records and um, the stories, the narrative at that time, the, uh, the students and apparently the uh, professors at the time were absolutely shocked and horrified that this black student would consider to become a Dominican friar. So we don't have um, any anything in writing about how Dominic responded to that after having spent six years at the school and realizing that he, it was a bridge too far for them to see him. Um, and they actually said they were repulsed by the idea that this black man would want to wear white robes. So we gather that he, I gather that he said goodbye to that dream and decided to go into medicine. So their loss, our gain, he goes to medical school. And even though the war sort of, there was a rupture there, he came back and became a doctor and enriched the lives of the black community in Montreal at that time. So I guess that was to our, for our benefit. So generally speaking, and those that know my research, the objective in really trying to understand the life and legacy of Dr. Gaspar is to really look at the historical silence of Blacks. There's so many pieces of his life that are punctuated by some expletive and oh my God moment and nothing else. Let's go on to another, another aspect. And um, this is very similar to the kinds of research what I as a researcher go through when I'm studying um, black history in general. So I think it's important because Dr. Gaspar was at the forefront of early Quebec medicine. He was one of, for lack of a better term, an elite within the community. He was a change maker. He was a, 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 a power broker within the community and, and seemed to wield a lot of influence, but he was not but. He was a righteous man from what I gather, and he was mourned greatly after his death. However, for me, I'm still trying to figure out why a generation later, because I came a generation afterwards, I didn't know anything about him. So I'm going to leave it at that. I don't want to go over my time. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share this research experience with you. And as you can tell, there's a lot more to come or there should be a lot more to come, God willing. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, Dr. Williams, for that amazing talk. And I do encourage people who uh, want to know more to read Dorothy's working paper, which is available on the Questgrin website. Dorothy, we're starting to get some questions in, and okay. I see there is one here already. Um, but I want to use my privilege as moderator to start start them off. I actually have four, but I'll stick to one. What does your surprise? Uh, you know, you 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 mentioned you kept being surprised that Catholicism that mm -hmm. he married a Protestant woman uh, that he had a legion named after him. 
that he went to a seminary, off-island experience. I mean, he seemed to represent for you uh, as the authority on the history, <clears throat> a series of surprises. So my question is, what does that tell us or tell you about the main narrative of the English-speaking Black Quebec history and experience that created this surprise in you? I, you know, I, it's, it's remarkable. It is remarkable, and it's, it almost pained me when I realized how there was these gaps in the storyline that I wasn't able to pull together. Um, and I realized that the people who might have helped me to fill that had already died. Had I been asking the questions in the 80s or the 70s, um, maybe I would have been able to just um, bring a little bit more fullness to the story. Um, unfortunately, starting to ask the kinds of questions that I'm asking now um, means that we're almost always going to have to depend on the written record somewhere, maybe in a diary, maybe in uh, a newspaper article or um, historical records such as the seminary. But I think it speaks to this whole issue of invisibility. I know we, we, we all are sort of have been mesmerized by the Black Lives Movement. And I just use that as sort of the arc of the, of the period, but other things have happened as well. Um, that has really brought home this whole idea of um, silence. Uh, Black people have been silenced in the narratives and there are many, many, um, I think now, people that are starting to wake up to the fact that um, these voices have not been heard and they need to be uh, shared and they need to be understood. The Black community has been a part of the English speaking Black community of Montreal in general. Um, for over pretty close to, to 200 years at this point. And um, yet they are still considered, I guess their narratives considered exotic um, or outside the pale. Black history is never taught in school in Quebec. Um, it's usually at the discretion of maybe one or two teachers in any given school. Um, it's a flavor of the month during Black History Month, but it's not integrated and sort of our understanding of, for lack of a better term, otherness in Quebec is really constrained, if you will, by this nomenclature called the English speaking community, right? Um, in most people's minds, they take that, you know, as people from Britain or the British Isles, et cetera. Um, and not realizing that there are other people who are part of that English speaking experience here in Quebec and they enrich that English speaking community SC uh, moniker, if you will. Um, and so many other stories have yet to be told about what is this English speaking community. Uh, we're not a monolith. We've come here and born here multiple generations and we have supported and developed Quebec in different ways. And how do these communities survive and thrive? His is the story to tell us that um, or to at least give us a glimpse of one aspect of it. Uh, yes, I was really, really surprised at how um, his Catholic journey, if you will, how that intersected in a very Protestant ethic community. Um, and that's still, I won't even go there in terms of the sociological and psychological or whatever uh, aspects that could also be brought to bear. I'm just trying to wrap my head around it as a historian. Um, that neatly segues into a question by Patrick Donovan. Uh, do you know, Dorothy, what percentage of the English-speaking Black community in Montreal was Catholic? Where they came from? Was it typical for them to migrate from Louisiana? Not a clue. No, I don't know. Well, we don't have scholars looking at Montreal as a whole. So um, I'm not sure of any studies looking at it from the perspective of religion. I believe there are there's an awful lot of material that's come out of UCAM and uh, U of M on language and blackness, but not about religion. Thank you. Um, Anna Hunt has a question. Hi, yeah, well, it's actually, it's related to um, a resource that I know that Dory Flee has working on with others um, related to the invisibility of the black community in the teaching of history. Um, 
about um, the ABCs of Black history, and I don't know if you, oh. it's a teaching resource, so I don't know if you maybe want to talk about, share that with the, with the, with the participants as well, because uh, um, I think it's a great resource, so I don't know if you want to, if you want to. Yeah, the, okay, so the ABCs of, um, it's, it's the ABCs of Canadian Black History Kit. It's a kit I created, and it came out of my, uh, my desire to give a resource for teachers. I wanted teachers to have um, the stories and to to know the stories of black canadians um it is uh, a kit that spans it's got 26 stories the abcs the whole alphabet so every letter's got some person or event um or a place in canada very significant to the black community development and history um it spans stories of um blacks from 1628 all the way up to uh, 1987 and um I made an effort when I put the kit together uh, to ensure that uh, we included as many provinces as possible and look at the pioneers in the different areas. Um, there's a Blacks in New Brunswick, uh, Nova Scotia, Manitoba, uh, Saskatchewan, etc. Um, and not just focus on the stories of um, the Black communities in Toronto or, or Halifax uh, or Montreal. Um, and, and again, I what I was trying to do was to give teachers enough uh material about uh the black experience and how how real it it was had the longevity of it going all the way back to Samuel de Champlain and um in within within uh, New France um to the present um and to give them a resource that they could get excited about enjoy these stories for themselves and then be more likely to teach these stories in their classrooms to the children. Um, understanding or recognizing that uh, black history has been, it's, it's, it's on the sidelines, not even on the sidelines. It's totally, totally ignored. It's been omitted. It's been erased. Um, but I did want to give them options. And part of the reason I think, uh, Anna, to, to, uh, to answer is that when I have actually shared stories of, you know, they've asked me to go on and go into schools and talk to the children, grade four, grade five, or grade six, it always disturbed me that um, most of the stories, I mean, and the kids were very excited about it. Here's a story of Nelson Mandela. Here's a story of, uh, you know, uh, Michael Jordan or uh, Obama, whomever. And, and it's great. I'm glad that these, these role models are there, but in the very beginning, I used to ask the teacher, where are the Canadian stories? I stopped doing that after several years because I realized that they would just look at me blankly. They had no clue any more than the kids did. Um, and they didn't really know which sites were credible online to send them to or which books or and that kind of thing. And I realized we they need a resource. Teachers need a resource to help them to teach these stories, to integrate these stories into the narrative. Um, and so that was the purpose behind the kit. And uh, so why we have the kit today. Thank you. A follow up to that, Dorothy, do you have, actually I'm asking a question, I think I know the answer, <laughs> but it would be interesting to get some details. Are there plans to put, to digitalize the kit, make it available yes. that way? Yes, yes, in fact, we have a Kickstarter campaign. We're right in the middle of it, yay, <laughs> to try to get, to get the funding so that we could get the proper resources and get this kit online. Um, so that um, it can be used right across the country. It's gonna, it would take many years and an awful lot of money to take the hard copy across the country. But we felt with the um, pandemic that now was the right time to push, especially for those schools that um, were looking for online resources and home schools or parents having to keep their kids at home. Could they use this resource? And everybody that sees the kit says, yes, yes, yes. I wish I had this when I, teachers tell me, I wish I had this when I was teaching. This would have been a great resource for me to use in my classroom. So that told me that it hit the mark and it really was trying, I was really trying to fill that gap. And I think there would be a wonderful opportunity to make many more kits, but at least this one, um, was speaking to what the teachers need in the classroom. So if we can get it online and figure out a way to um, digitize and make interactive what's, you know, on paper, um, then it'll be a great resource for, for schools to use. Thank you, Dorothy. Now, now, now back to history. History content, I mean. 
What is a Garveyite and why were you so surprised that Dr. Gaspa was one? Well, what is a Garveyite? The most successful black corporation in the history of the world was a Garveyite institution. It was created by Marcus Garvey, who was born in Jamaica. He believed, um, I'm gonna have to take it in like really, cause there are, there are libraries full of Garveyite books, but um, his philosophy was that, um, or his principles were that at that time, so there had been 1910, white people didn't want black people around them. Black people create their own wealth. Let's combine our wealth together and create our own institutions and support our own community. The United States at that time, and indeed a lot of the Western um, countries were undergoing what we call in Canada, Negrophobia it was actually a period of time in Canadian history called Negrophobia. Um, and it paralleled the post reconstruction period in the United States, the period of lynching. So where you see blacks dangling from trees with nooses around their neck and white people having picnics underneath uh, dangling black bodies. Um, you have in uh, the West Indies a, um, a reaction for the white planters against um, blacks who were at that time uh, struggling for independence and economic uh, support. Um, it, it was a hemispheric uh, reaction. So Garvey started the Universal Negro, well, in Montreal called Improvement Association. In the United States, it was Universal Negro Loyal Association. Um, he developed factories. He set up uh, all kinds of businesses. He had a massive membership. Um, he was, let's see, 60 countries. He had members from 60 countries, uh, totaling six to seven million members around the world. Um, he was wealthy beyond, uh, beyond words at that time. Um, the United States shut him down. He moved from Jamaica, he went and based himself in the United States. Um, there were UNIAs uh, across the country. So you had them in Toronto, you had them in Montreal. Um, it still exists, that organization still exists. It's on Notre Dame and Atwater. Um, and he was shut down because of tax evasion. So they got him, they threw him in jail and it discredited the organization. He was trying to repopulate. One of his goals was to repopulate um, a country in the United, in Africa, because again, fully convinced that white people didn't want black people and we're only gonna continue to kill black people and X them out of economic in opportunity and social mobility. Um, he actually started the Black Star steamship lines and he got these big ocean liners that he was going to pack with blacks willing to leave from new york and uh, virginia i think and go to this uh, place he was carving i think it was with the brits to carve a space near liberia so that african americans and blacks all across the the western hemisphere could go back to africa um yeah, that's pretty long encapsulation but it, it was a massive movement and uh, the UNIA was the very first organization that opened up here in Montreal as a community organization so people went there they had social events they had um, uh, community education um, for some people it was a religious organization other people it was a military organization uh, the Garveyite philosophy was taught the same Garveyite philosophy was taught worldwide so you became part of a, a, a movement towards black empowerment written up in that day. It, it, so that's what the UNIA was all about. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, your, your, your answers are, are so, well, the this, this stories you're telling are so fascinating. And, and I'm sure it's certainly very enlightening to me. And I'm sure most of the people, uh, a lot of this information is new. Um, now, I, I don't want to, I, Anna, am I correct in saying there are no written questions of, at this point? Because I, I have more. Um, and this is maybe, 
moving it into um, a more contemporary realm. You know, Dorothy, very clearly, uh, you're doing two things at once. You are doing the history and you're advocating and promoting the history yes. in many, many ways. You give, I've, I've known you for years and I've been so pleased to see you at um, scholarly events, at popular events. Um, you've developed the ABCs of Canadian Black history. Um, you're here today. Meanwhile, now we have Black Lives Matter becoming absolutely central to the political language in North America, including in Canada. Um, and many of the people involved are young Black people and others, of course, but young Black people um, militating for change. And on the other hand, and, and th so that's one thing going on. Another thing going on is the English speaking community at large, including black communities, are working in various ways to promote a sense of belonging of English speaking Quebecers in the province of Quebec. In fact, there's a, a project underway right now with the Secretariat des Relations des Anglophones. I've got the name wrong, I should correct that. Uh, Secretariat aux relations avec les Québécois d'expression anglaise. So I'm wondering, how do you feel, if, if you could address the English speaking community of Quebec or the people involved in the Black Lives Matter um, movement, how do you feel looking at something like the history of Dr. Gaspard can move those movements and those initiatives forward in positive ways. You're talking about it as his life represented? The work you're doing on it, the story, the, the, oh, the I see. It, well, I'm, as a, I'm throwing a big question out, but yeah, you know, I, I, I need to think about it. But as I said before, to me, it's, it's sort of emblematic of so many stories that have yet to be told. I don't know what I don't know. And that's what happens when I start teaching, um, uh, black history to the kids in school, um, I realized very quickly, it's very crazy to ask them, well, what do you want me to teach you? They don't know <laughs> what they don't know. It's the same thing here. As I'm learning about Dr. Uh, Gaspar's life and his impact in the community, um, I've been humbled to realize that there are probably many other stories that have always been there that I glossed over, didn't realize, didn't have enough of the, um, the eye, researcher eye at the time, to give it a second glance. And unfortunately, part of the problem, uh, Lorraine, is that I've been talking about Black history and the need for more research, the need for more scholars. I've been doing this for over 30 years. I'm still doing the same. I said from the beginning when my first book came out, you know what? You can't create a discipline with one book. Everybody's like, oh, it's so wonderful. You've got this book on black history in Montreal. And I say, yeah, so what? What does that mean in a particular field? How is that going to move the agenda? You need to have three or four books. We need people to come together and say, well, you know, you were right on page six, but page 17, you made a mistake. I went back over those archives and I found X, Y, Z. Beautiful. That's okay. You begin a dialogue. That's how a discipline is built. That's how you, you gain um, credibility. And that's how you push people to look for more and to be more precise in, in their analyses. Um, it is, it's great. I'm only one person. Um, I could make this my life's work, which would probably be maybe another five years. Uh, we need to nurture. Um, and what I would tell those, those youngsters, I'm, it's wonderful that you're going into law. It's wonderful you're going into medicine. Um, but we also need thinkers. We need historians. We need people to challenge the past, to seek out more. Um, more stories and, and more oh my God moments to share and just allow everybody to be, uh, to understand um, how we contributed 
and what we what we brought forth in our little corners and 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 did it touch what was the impact in the wider community we can't begin to answer that question until we start doing some serious research some basic research and begin to understand um the the impact of um, of the lives and the institutions and culture i think the only thing that we ever investigate to any great degree lorraine is entertainment it's like it's the it's sort of like the intersection is where it comes in right so you come into the black community through jazz through music and so that's kind of where the narrative stays and and there's nothing wrong with 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 looking at the blacks that participated in the golden age what i call the golden age of black montreal but what about before and what about after and so this is all of that it is the before and the after straddling the jazz period or through the jazz period and so what are the other stories and lessons that we can learn um if we're just looking post jazz period we're never going to understand that connection with saint hyacinth and the united states when did that end um as far as i know dr gaspar was the last why um, was it the First World War that did it, or was there some other thing going on? Um, how did that even begin? So just that in and of itself, to me, is just, it's, it's more than enough rationale to, um, for these young, young activists to push for more research, opening up the university to Black studies, Black Canadian studies. Um, I think it's great that Miguel has um, what they call African studies, but you can go to Miguel for, for three years, four years, and learn all you want about South Africa or Nigeria, but you will never know about the Black community just down the street, because they don't have one course on Blacks in Canada, and particularly not Blacks in Montreal. So it's a highly, in some ways, I'm disheartened by that, and um, that needs to change. We need to open up the dialogue to understand what's in our midst. Um, and every time we do, we find more and more connections across the border, um, more and more hemispheric connections, continental connections. Um, there's still so much to learn about ourselves. What a call to action from Dr. Williams. Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not making light of it. I, 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 you know, I'm your biggest fan. And I think the work you do is, is um, profoundly important. I would like to give my warmest thanks and word of appreciation to Dorothy Williams, who has done work that has actually shaped utterly the, the history that, that what we call, what historians call the historiography, the written histories about English speaking Quebec and about Quebec. And um, because of the work you've done for many years, we have a better understanding of our collective past and the, the history of English speaking Black communities. It looks like we need to pluralize because they were complex. And you've also given us an exciting um, agenda of research required for the future. And you've hinted maybe you're going to be at it for another five years. So those in the room who are educators or are in contact with young people who are looking for work to do in, in the field of history or community development, obviously we have a very fruitful um, avenue that has you know that it seems almost endless it, you know you just pointed out a whole new couple of areas that need exploration so um with that i would like to thank dorothy and ask everybody if they want to put on their camera so dorothy can see who's been enjoying the talk and say goodbye thank you very much thank you thank you dorothy